everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, for today's event. Um, I would like uh, to begin today um, by acknowledging that uh, UBC is situated on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tlaloc nations. Um, I'm happy to um, um, host today's event um, together with um, my colleague, uh, Mustafa Abedini Fad, um, uh, an event in our lecture series, uh, the Ali Reza Ahmadiyan Lectures in Iranian and Persian Studies. Ali Reza Ahmadiyan was an enthusiastic researcher, a sociopolitical analyst, and opinion leader in foreign policy. And he was a proud and devoted UBC alumnus, a supporter of UBC's Department of Asian Studies and a beloved member of the Iranian uh, Canadian community. And the department renamed this lecture series in, in his honor in 2019. And Ali Reza's friends uh, in the community have provided funding to support this series for which we are um, very grateful. Today, we will um, hear a talk um, entitled Twelve Shiite Martyrologies in Turkic, the Politics of Translation and Ritual in Early Modern Iran. And our speaker today is Ferenc Çirkeş, and our discussant is Catherine Babaya. I would uh, also like to thank very much the behind the scenes team, um, Lisa, Tiffany, and Gianna, as well as uh, Razman, uh, Gudarzi for the wonderful poster designs. And uh, now it is my pleasure um, to briefly introduce um, our speaker and our discussant. Um, Ferenc Cirkej uh, studies the literary and cultural history of medieval and early modern Iran, Central Asia and the Ottoman Empire. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago and is currently an assistant professor of history at the University of Birmingham. And prior to that, he worked at Simon Fraser and Sabanje Universities, the University of Tübingen and Central European University. He's currently completing a book manuscript about the politics of Turkic in medieval and early modern Iran. Today's discussant, uh, Catherine Babayan, specializes in the social history and culture of the early modern Persian world, gender studies, and the history of sexuality. She has just been awarded a national endowment for the Humanities Fellowship for 2024-25. Congratulations. Babayan is the author of two award-winning books, uh, Mystics, Monarchs, and Messiahs, Cultural Landscapes of Early Modern Iran, and the City as Anthology, Eroticism and Urbanity in Early Modern Isfahan. Catherine Babayan has also co-authored Slays of the Shah, New Elites of Safavi Iran, with Susan Babai, Ina Bahtian Smekabe, and Masume Farhad, and co-edited two books, Islamic and Sexualities, Translations Across Temporal Geographies of Desires with Afsoni Najma Badi, and An Armenian Mediterranean, Words and Worlds in Motion with Michael Kiefer. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for being here. It is truly an honor um, to have both of you here today. Um, and with that, I invite um, Ferenc um, to begin uh, his presentation. And I will invite um, Catherine to uh, make some remarks and uh, questions afterwards before we open the floor to questions from the audience. Great, thank you very much, Ferenc. You're all good to go. Thanks very much, Alexandra. Uh, can you uh, see the presentation? Good, thank you. And thanks very much, Catherine, for uh, joining us. Uh, I really appreciate the honor uh, to be here uh, to, and uh, to be with you, both distinguished colleagues and, well, being invited to this uh, prestigious uh, talk series at uh, the University of British Columbia. So again, again, thank you uh, very much. 
So the title of the talk again is 12 Shiite Martyrologies in Turkic, the Politics of Translation and Ritual in Early Modern uh, Iran. So this paper will focus on a hitherto entirely unknown work titled Jinan al-Mu'minin, a paradise of the believers, a 12, 12 Shiite martyrology or a so-called maktal, written in Turkic in Iran at the end of the 17th or in the first four decades of the 18th centuries. I will argue that the work is best seen against the background of the tectonic shifts taking place in the period in early modern Iran in religion and politics. The paper is part of my on ongoing project, a book project about the politics of Turkic in, in late medieval and early modern Iran, uh, which discusses Turkic literature and literary practices in relation to such broad processes as vernacularization, confessionalization, and state building. So uh, today's presentation <clears throat> that is uh, is part of a project that that uh, is about Turkophone literary traditions, uh, and it faces a num number of challenges. The majority of scholarship can be characterized either by, either by neglect or bias. On the one hand, this field of inquiry has been treated with neglect in Western scholarship, which is still largely structured along ethno-nationalist lines. While the overall majority of scholars working with Turkish material uh, focus on the Ottoman Empire, Persianists only discuss Iranian uh, or Mughal history. Only a handful of scholars worked on Turkic literature in Iran in the 1940s through the 1980s, and a few others more recently. Nearly all the scholarship primarily focused on contextualizing the messianic antinomian poetry of Shah Ismail I, the founder of the Safavid dynasty. On the other hand, the field has also been subject to ethno-nationalist bias, Iranian nationalist scholarship all but completely ignoring it, and Soviet and post-Soviet Azerbaijani scholars overemphasizing the Turkic element in early modern Iran, almost falling uh, silent over the significance of Persian both as a literary language and as part of early modern Turco-Iranian political culture. There is some useful recent scholarship produced by Azeri scholars that surveys Azeri Turkish literary production, even if most of it is little more than descriptive philology and best, more often than not, based on low quality textual editions. Such lacune and bias in scholarship is problematic not only in and of itself, but also because it has facilitated greater nationalist historical models that project a homogenizing state-centered vision back to pre-modern times. In the presentation first, uh, I will talk, I'm sorry, uh, I'll talk uh, about the politics of Turkic in early modern, in the early modern period, discussing vernacularization, confessionalization, confessionalization and state building. I will then focus on the genre of the Makta, that is martyrology, describing the events around the Battle of Karbala, where Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, was massacred, along with the members of his household. I will then touch on Khan Shafi's Rosat of Shohada, the most paradigmatic representative of the Makta genre, written in Persian at the end of the 15th century, which served as a blueprint both for further renditions of the story in Persian and Turkic, and for the so-called Rosakhani as a ritual, that is, public storytelling about Karbala. We will then zoom on to the, the aforesaid Jinana Mukminin and compare it to Karshafi's Rosetta Shohada, <coughs> contextualizing it against the background of 12 Shiite uh, institu institutionalization and the religious practices of the Turkophone element in early modern Iran. We will finally end with a glimpse at the reign of Nader Shah, uh, who ruled between seven, uh, 1736 to 1747, who came in the wake of the collapsing Safavids and pursued policies that had characterized the Turkic tribal milieu that he came from. As is well known, the early modern period in Islamic Eurasia saw the rise of large territorially based empires. The Safavid, Ottoman and Mughal empires, as well as the Uzbek Khanates of Central Asia all came from the same tribal matrix of the, the, of the post-Mongol world, but ended up on different sides of a linguistic and confessional divide. In this way, Iran became Shi and Persephone, while the Ottoman Empire and most of Central Asia became Sunni and Turkophone. This was all part of a globalizing early modernity in which states both in the West and in the Islamic East assumed 
tangible religious identities in a process called confessionalization, that is, the merger of religious and political identities. The process has similarities to how, for example, Anglican England, Catholic France, Catholic Habsburg, or Lutheran Swedes came about. Confessionalization went hand in hand with vernacularization. New converts, whether followers of Luther in Europe, Balkan populations converting to Islam, or urban converts to Shiism, convert, converts to Shiism dwelling in cities in Iran, needed to be able to access the revelation and information about religious practices and dogma in their own language. In the process, the cosmopolitan world of Latinitas in the West gave way to vernacular languages such as German, Spanish, French, English, or Italian in the West. While in the Islamic world, we see Ottoman Turkish taking over the social functions uh, of Arabic and Persian, and we also see the spread in the use of such vernacular languages as Urdu uh, on the subcontinent or Chagatai Turkic in Central Asia uh, and others. Most conversion was carried out by various Sufi groups, uh, Sufism having increasingly become the chief form of piety from the 11th century onwards, and assuming the form of Sufi messianic movements in the, way, in the wake of the waning Mongol rule in the Persianate world from the 14th century on. As many of these Sufi groups pursued antinomian practices that were at odds with the Sharia, such networks had tremendous political and social potency, the Safavids themselves also starting out as such a group. A key target for proselytization was, was Turkic nomads who had migrated with the Mongol conquest and brought in a political culture that fundamentally challenged the urban culture of the Sharia, basically in the entire uh, uh, Islamic uh, Eurasia. Turkic as a continuation of literary practices from the post-Mongol era in Muslim Eurasia was part of Safavid political culture and has today constituted a robust uh, literary subculture in Iran next to, Persian, to the Persian mainstream. Turkic literature in Safavid Iran goes back to two roots, corresponding to the cultural and political background and ideals of the Turkophone tribes, the so-called Kuzilbash that constituted the backbone of the Safavid military. One of these roots was the Chagatai Turkic literary tradition, which connected the Safavids to the Timurids of the 14th and 15th centuries on the one hand, and on the other hand, to the rest of the Muslim Turkic world, including the Uzbeks, the Mughals, and the Ottomans, as Chagatai Turkic was cultivated to varying degrees in all these territories. The other route for Turkophone literary practices in Iran was what we can call the West Oguz or Turkmen literary tradition, best known for the antinomian poetry of the Hurufi Nesimi and the aforesaid Shah Ismail I, as well as for the poetry of Fuzuli of Baghdad. This literary idiom was cultivated from Anatolia to Western Iran, Northern Syria and Iraq, and had Ottoman and had Ottoman Turkish split off it. In, a, in around the mid 15th century. Indeed, this is the idiom referred to as Azerbaijani Turkish since the early 20th, 20th century. Both the Chagatai and the Turkmen or West or West Turkic uh, or Azerbaijani literary idioms continued their sway under the Safavids in the 16th century as part of the literary heritage of the Kuzulbash as well as the Safavid dynasty, the Turkic was never in a position to challenge the status and proliferation of Persian in Iran. Initially, the Safavid social order was, was just another version of what uh, Marshall Hodgson termed the Amirayan system, that is the symbiosis of a Turkic military aristocracy and Persianate urban intelligentsia, a social order that had characterized the Islamic world since the 11th century. However, in order to attain legal coherence and legitimacy for their rule, the Safavids recruited 12 Shiite scholars from Iraq, Iraq, Lebanon, and Bahrain, who with the patronage of the Safavid elite set out to implement 12 Shiite legal practices that ultimately challenged the antinomian Sufi culture of the Kuzulbash. At the end of the 16th century, the new ruler, Shah Abbas I, who ruled between 1588 to 1629, carried out hitherto unseen centralizing reforms in administration, the military, finances, and the economy, 
and he also cracked down on antinomian messianic groups. The Kuzilbash lost their primacy in politics, but they by no means disappeared. However, scholarship has so far greatly neglected scrutinizing their religiosity after the end of the 16th century. In Iran, early modern vernacularization arguably meant the final victory of Persian over Arab. Islamic and Persian as a written language, termed New Persian by historical linguists, had, uh, had risen in the 9th century in eastern Iran and Central Asia as part of the cultural and political profile of Persephone elites when the caliphate as a central institution could no longer project the same power and prestige that it had, that it had held in previous periods. After that, Mongol rule starting in the 13th century meant the co-optation of Persephone bureaucracies everywhere in Islamic and Eurasia. From the 16th century, the Shiitization of, the, of Iran under the Safavids meant that Persians stepped into fields such as theology or law that had hitherto been exclusively dominated by Arabic. Indeed, parallel to the Ottoman genre of Ilm Ehad, Iran also saw the proliferation of manuals teaching Persephone Shiites the basic tenets of theology, law, and orthopraxis in accessible Persian. It is here that we should mention the genre of, of the Maktal or martyrology. The Maktal as, Maktal as a genre was known from Arabic literature since the 8th century. In Arabic, it was based on an extensive use of hadith and reports. The first Persian version of the Maktal, however, fundamentally reshaped the genre. In a stroke of irony, one of the first representatives of the Maktal in Persian and one of the key texts for the for 12 Shiite public ritual, the Rosa to Shohada, was written by a Sunni. Hussein Loyaz Kashafi was a member of the circles around the Timurid court in Herat and was initiated into the Sunni Naqshbandi network. John Wood has famously coined the term confessional ambiguity to account for the phenomenon in the post-Mongol world of nominal Sunnis engaging in technically Shi'i practices like devotion to the house of the prophet. Well, um, this is definitely such a case. The Maktal as a genre of popular narrative poetry had been known in Anatolia since the 14th century, where it had been also known in Anatolia since the 14th century, where it continued to be cultivated. One might want to think of Yusuf Ahmed from the 14th century, who wrote his Masnavi for the Jandar in 1362. And the genre continued regardless of the heavy Sunni turn of the Ottomans. One could think of Lami Chalabi's uh, narrative poem from the early 16th century. We should also mention the so-called Abu Muslim, Muslim Nama tradition, prose epics detailing the adventures and exploits of Abu Muslim against the Umayyads and the Abbasids, connecting him with the house of Ali and calling for revenge for his murder and that of the uh, for, for, for his murder and for the murder of the Ali's. Indeed, these genres were, were part of the storytelling culture that the Kizilbash brought uh, with them when they rallied around the Safavid banners and relocated to the territories of the nascent Safavid state uh, <coughs> from the Ottoman Empire. The Rosette has a homiletic style, this is the, uh, uh, likely intended for preaching. Kashafi uses Arabic quotes sparingly, and even, even when he does, he accompanies them with a translation and an exegesis in Persian. It is divided into 10, ten chapters, um, each centered on the stories of the afflictions or suffering bala, a, a, a certain group or individual uh, underwent. As recently analyzed by Paul Gerard Anderson in his dissertation, the Rosette is centered on three main themes, suffering or affliction, testing, balar, as a primordial human condition, weeping as, as the proper human reaction to it, uh, that is weeping over the tragedy of Hussein and, and his family. And this can lead to Hussein's intercession on the day of judgment and ultimately to salvation. Karshafi presents this through major innovation to the Maktal genre, most notably its simple language, suffused, simple Persian language suffused with poetry and popular stories, most importantly from the Shahnameh, for, from the Shahnameh, Photovath literature and Sufism, leading Abbas Amonat and Anderson to evaluate it as the Persianization of the Shiite of the Shi myth 
and thereby serving as a suitable textbook for Shi storytelling and ritual practices in the Safavid era and afterwards. By the late 17th century, Koshifi's work became a veritable bestseller. At the same time, the practice of Rosa Khani, that is recitation of Koshifi's or similar texts, became integrated into, integrated into elaborate state-sponsored public rituals as part of the Muharram mourning and as part of the Safavids' attempt at controlling religious practices and project power. This was part of the process of the institutionalization of Tuaba Shism along with the creation of Tuaba Sharia, Tuaba Sharia, Tuaba Shia and Sharia based legal practices in a parallel process to the ascendance of Shiite scholars in key administrative and judiciary positions and the concomitant decrease in the power of the Khuzil Bar. Indeed, by the mid 17th century, Safavid governors took over the organization and control of Muharram uh, processions from local Futurbak uh, networks or guild or Sufi networks. Indeed, the Rosat uh, became immensely popular and was translated into Ottoman Turkish several times already in the 16th century. The Safavid elite was also heavily invested in it, which can be demonstrated not only by the great number of manuscript copies the Rosat was circulating in, but also by the fact that already in the first half of the 16th century, it had two Turkic translations. One was titled uh, Shuhadanama and was completed in 1539 by uh, a certain Muhammad ibn Qat ibn Shati, who had dedicated his work to Shah Tahmas and to the son of the Kuzilbash Turkmen governor of Shiraz, Kazifan Sarushay. Uh, Shira, Shiraz was an important center for manuscript production, and several members of the Kuzilbash Oymak, Oymak Zulkadar, which governed Shiraz until 1596, were interested in the cultivation of Turkic literary practices, both as patrons and literati. Neshati, therefore, has another translation to his name, that of the Sahvat of Safa the official Safavid hagiography hagi written by Ibn Bazaz uh, in, the, in the last quarter of the, of the 14th century. Written in a simple, accessible uh, Turkic, Neshatiz is a relatively free, faithful translation of the Rosa, except that his poetic insertions are his own. But it, this requires a bit for, uh, more research on my part. There was another translation of the Rosa that also became a bestseller. It is unknown when Fuzuli of Baghdad, who died in 1556, wrote uh, the Habikat Soeda, which is an interesting question because after 1534, autumn, after the first. After the 1534 Ottoman capture of Baghdad, he lived another 20 years and dedicated his works to the Ottoman sultans or other Ottoman patrons. Based on the available manuscripts, uh, the editor of the work, Shaima Günger, avers that it was written for Ottoman patrons, but cannot give a date of composition. Be that as it may, Fuzuli's work became immensely popular both in the Ottoman and Safavid empires. One of the reasons for its popularity might have been that its complex, elegant, ornate style interspersed, interspersed with poetry, as well as the theme of devotion to the house of the prophet fit well contemporary Ottoman sensibilities. And now we can turn to the Jinan al-Mu'mini, the subject of today's presentation. As to the author, we don't know much. In the preface to the work, he designates himself Reza'i Khaksari, Khaksari, that is vile, abject, likely being a mere just gesture of modest civility. We don't, do not know when exactly Reza wrote the Jinan. In the preface, he makes a reference to the Jal, uh, Jalal Oyum, an extensive makta written in uh, 1685 by Muhammad Bakhir Majlisi, one of the most important figures in an increasingly crystallized and institutionalized 12 Shism under the Safavids. One of the three extant uh, uh, copies, sorry, yeah. one of the three uh, extant copies, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, so one of the three extant copies of the Jinan was copied by one Mullah Mirza Muhammad 
uh, in Mullah Muhammad Ghazvini in 1739, and is housed today at the Majlis or Parliamentary Library in Tehran. Another copy was executed by one Muhammad Mu'min in Tabriz in uh, 1740, and it is housed uh, in the library of the Ossetan and Quds in Mashhad. And there is a third undated copy at the library of Tehran University, considered to date from the 17th or 18th centuries in the Catholic. The Jinan must therefore have been authored sometime between 1685, the date of Majlis's work, and 1739, the date of the earlier copy of the Jinan. Rizal introduced major changes to his model. Instead of Koshifi's 10 chapters, Rizal's Jinan is divided into 47, seven cha 43 chapters. Why 43? Without attempting to give a definite answer, it is possible to speculate that uh, 40 would be easier to explain, as in that case, each chapter would correspond to the 40 days between Ar Ashura and Arbaeen on the 20th of Safar in the Muslim, Safar in the Muslim calendar. However, if one tweaks the sequence of the individual stories, for example, by, by lumping to the, together the Hussein-related one, the Hussein-related ones, it's possible to fit the work into this holy period of the year. Into this holy period of the year, it also is. It is also possible to hypothesize that the loose structure is caused by the intended uh, intended function of the Janan as a kind of Rosa Khani manual or mnemonic device. As we will see later, the style of the work greatly facilitates such a reading. In the preface of the Janan, we learn of important details of the motivation behind the creation of the work. In a customary imaginary scene in the preface, Reza claims that he was approached by friends who encouraged to write a maktal in Turkic, because the genre exists in Persian and Arabic, uh, which Turks will not understand. They then add, Mevlana Fuzuli, may God be gratified by him, composed the Hadikat al suada and Turks can benefit from it. But the power of the understanding of commoners cannot comprehend some of, some of his expressions. And the strength of the sermon of some of the Turks is weak in understanding his phrases. Praise be to God that the anthology composed by, young, by your tongue is elegant, and the parrot of your character has the power to sing well. Therefore, you have to render in writing the affairs of martyrs of, of the martyrs of Karbala, the prophet's greatly afflicted, afflicted family. You need, you need to unveil the face of the difficulties in the words and expressions, like the face of a bride and beauty and uh, face of a bride, and beautify it such that commoners like it. You need to drop some of, of, of some of the more recherche phrases that are vo void of gravitas and, and gravitas and, and, and anxiety, and make them concise and short, for brevity in speech is required. We can come to a few conclusions here. One, the work is not a royal com commission. Reza is familiar with Fuzuli's Hadika, but not with the with the Nesh with, with Shuhana Indeed, the circulation of the latter never to never that is Neshat Ishwaranama apparently never to, never took off, and the work survives in only a single copy. Three, uh, Reza's uh, Reza positions his work as as much simpler in style than Fuzuli's, uh, which, as we have discussed above, is written in a rhetorically rich, greatly lit, greatly literate style. Reza presents the style of his own work. Much more straightforward, as much more straightforward and concise. If, if we consider how integrated Rosa Khani was in Shiite public ritual in Iran by this time, it is most certain that the text uh, uh, mostly intended uh, was mostly intended as an aid for public performance. Arguably, Fuzuli may have had a highly literate or Fuzuli uh, may have had a highly literate audience in mind and paid less heed to whether his work might or might not be subject to public performance, unlike Reza. He was writing, Fuzuli that is, was writing at a time when a devotion to the house of the prophet was part and parcel of a cosmopolitan turco version aid Shi'i Sufi literary culture. Reza, on the other hand, was writing when Shi'ite theology and legal and ritual practices had been much better known. At the same time, Reza's assertion about his own style are not entirely true. 
In certain passages in the Jinan, his language assumes features that are hyperliterate, very ornate. However, those are rather infrequent and are placed in separate sections of the narrative. The majority of the individual stories about the martyrdom of the heroes of Karbala follow the same pattern. The, an introductory mourning, a threnody of Mar Marcia, the praise of the martyr in question, followed by the story. This is different from the structure of both Karl Shafi and Fuzuli's texts, in which the narrative uh, is interspersed with poetry. So you encounter a narrative and that is interspersed with poetry. Um, both Fuzuli and Reza follow Karshafi in their respective introduction. Accordingly, all three of these works are presented as a commentary uh, on uh, Quran uh, to 155-57. We shall indeed test you with some experience of, of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits. But give good news to the patient who say, when a smiting smites them, surely we belong to God, and surely to him we return. Those, on them there are blessings from the, their Lord and mercy. Those, they are the rightly guided ones. As God loves the prophets and saints most, it is, it is them who are tried with afflictions, Bala the most. And as God loved the prophet and his, fa his family the best, it is uh, them who suffer above everyone else. It is therefore man's duty to mourn and weep over the suffering of the Ahli Bay. The narratives also, uh, in addition, the narrative also presents prophets and saints who hear of and mourn for. Um, <clears throat> so the narrative also presents, uh, no, sorry, excuse me. So uh, the narrative also uh, 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 asks uh, for mourn for. Um, so the narrative also 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 claims that um, uh, it is a virtue to uh, mourn for uh, mourn for the, the 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 house of the prophet and also to facilitate uh, mourning. Therefore, mourning assumes atemporal cosmic dimensions. Reza's work is arguably based on a different conception of time from either Kashafi or Fuzuli. The two 16th century narratives rely on a cyclical conception of time. The drama of Karbala is played, placed in an endlessly returning series of cycles of trials and tribulations, but Bala, visited on first, uh, on first, the, on, first on biblical prophets and saints, and then on Muhammad, and finally on Ali and his family, culminating in Karbala, which is in this sense, which in this sense assumes cosmic dimensions. The narrative ends with the, the aftermath of Karbala, including stories about what befell the women and children of Hussein's household and how the murderers of his family and companions met an ignoble death afterwards. The Rosette ends with, sh with uh, short accounts of the lives of, of, of the nine Imams coming after Hussein, including the last one in a quotation, Muhammad ibn, uh, Hassan, uh, uh, ibn, ibn al Hassan the Mahdi. Reza's narrative, on the other hand, has more of a linear structure, and its time frame is also different. He, he focuses on the lead up to Karbala and the battle itself, and he doesn't present it in the framework of human history that starts with creation. A history starts with the last days of the Prophet Muhammad, continuing with the martyrdom of Ali, the death of, of Fatima, the martyrdom of Hassan and Hussein, and some of his companions and family members, and culminating with the scene at the Last Judgment, when Fatima asks, asks God to grant salvation to those who cried over the martyrdom of her of his sons. The temporal focus is matched, matched by the fact that Reza's narrative almost exclusively mentions Muslims. Um, <clears throat> We can also have a look at uh, one of the narratives uh, from the Jinnan uh, um, about uh, Horus' uh, mar martyrdom. After the threnody and the long uh, list of epithets for Hur, um, who, who is originally uh, uh, the commander of, of the uh, Umayyad governor uh, sent to uh, uh, capture uh, Hussein, capture or kill Hussein, 
So after the friendly, we see the Huris of Paradise waiting for Hussein as a guest, saying, quote, the king of Karbala is coming as a guest. On the other side, the angel of punishment stirred up, stirred up the harsh and strong flames of fear. The fire and the strata of hell were dashing with each other. He lit the fire and cried, are there any more to come? That is, which is from the Quran. Uh, requesting the enemies of the family of the prophet. Different punishments are prepared in the pits of hell as the souls of the sinners enter. The interesting facet of this part is the, pre is the, is the presence of the other world at the Battle of Karbala. We have only seen this at the beginning of the Janan when Muhammad was in communication with Gabriel. The constant presence of heaven awaiting the martyrs and hell awaiting the accursed is accompanied by the aforesaid ornate prose that follows the threnody and Hur's epithets. Hur ibn Yazid is from the nobles of Kufa and the com commander of Ibn Ziyad, the governor of, um, of uh, Kufa. He says to Umar ibn Sa'd, his uh, uh, commander, you fight against Hussein. How are, we, how are you going to give an answer to Muhammad on the day of judgment? Umar Saad doesn't say a word, and Hur returns to his position, his members are shaking. His brother says he, sa says he sees that he's afraid. Hur replies, I hesitate between paradise and hell, but have chosen paradise. Then he goes over to Hussein's camp and submits to him, asking if his repentance can be accepted. He wants to join in the fight, but Hussein first says that he is a guest and he should, should let first the others fight. Hur says, quote, O oh, son of the prophet of God, I, wa I was the first to block your way. Please allow me to be the first to scatter my life for you on the field of Karbala. Hur goes to battle, first addressing the people of Kufa. He chastises them for not letting Hussein drink from the Euphrates, which is allowed for animals. Uh, which is actually a constant epithet of the Euphrates. He adds that, there, that, that therefore God will not spare them from thirst on the day of judgment. After Saad, that is the uh, Kufan commander, says that everyone should be witness that he shot the first arrow at Hussein, the other shower Hussein and his people with arrows, wounding most of them. Hur valiantly fights and returns to Hussein and asks him if he's pleased with him and, and whether he has, um, 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 and if he's pleased with him. Hussein says, yes, I'm pleased with you and you are sp uh, spared from the fire of hell. So uh, don't want to uh, you know, uh, continue, but basically this, 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 is the, this is the way the story continues. Uh, who are always uh, returning uh, to Hussein who uh, always kind of uh, confirms and f uh, confirms his valiance and finally, uh, who were uh, succumbing uh, to his wounds uh, inflicted by the uh, Maya, <coughs> the Kufan. The narrative is less complex than in Koshafi, where, as Paul Gerard Anderson argues, we encounter a veritable epic scene from the Shahnameh with, quote, quote, with, with, with quotes from the Shahnameh. While in Koshafi we see lances piercing multiple bodies and blood flowing everywhere, Reza leaves out, leaves out some of the details from Kashifi, greatly shortening the interaction between Hur and his brother and focusing on the flow of the action. Also, while we encounter straight quotations from the Shachnam and Kashifi, Reza supplies his own poetry, though I have yet to see if he makes literary references or imitates poetry by others. I argue that this text was prepared with a focus on the dramatic, performative aspect of the Maktar. What do we know about the cultural political context of Reza's Turkic translation of the Rosetta Shahada? As stated earlier, scholarship is largely silent about Turkophone religious practices in the 17th and 18th centuries. While it's difficult to give a full assessment at this point, I'm tempted to hypothesize that the court in the 17th century and possibly in its latter half, as well as in the first decades of the 18th century, along with uh, networks around it, made an attempt at what Nor Norbert Elias calls civili civilizing mission, addressed uh, to the Turkic element of the Safavid realm. One might wish to think of a small coterie of prominent poets 
who, uh, for example, one might wish to think of a small coterie of prominent poets who experimented with the fresh style, otherwise known as the Sapke Hindi, the India style, a highly intellectual, innovative approach to poetry applying to it to Turkic. Poets like Saeb, Vaheze Kazvini, or Vahide, uh, Vahide Kazvini, uh, the latter a long time uh, Grand Vizier, produced several poetic specimens in this style in Turkic, which is based on a radically new attitude to poetic imagery and a novel epistemology for poetic language. Even more interestingly, we know of a summa of uh, Imam Ishiism, uh, of Imam Ishiism, uh, titled Esbate Imam Ap, composed in Turkey between 1614 and 20, 1621 by the otherwise unknown Khodaverdi Ahari Tabrizi. Khodaverdi produced the work at the behest of Shah Abbas, who intended it to be presented to Shah Giray, a Crimean prince and political refuge, refugee, in, in order to con convert him to Shiism and use him in a possible anti-Ottoman uh, alliance. Uh, the work survives in several copies. Uh, you can see uh, two, uh, one of them. Actually, the, the latter one uh, was uh, executed by quite a prominent um, calligrapher um, by the name of Mohtash and Mr. Esfahani. Another context is provided if we consider the turbulent period between the late 17th century and 1739, uh, the copy date of the earliest copy of the Jinnah. In 1722, the Safavid state collapsed, the realm being taken over by the Afghans, Ottomans, and Russians. As is well known, Nader Shah, uh, <coughs> the, the uh, Afshar Turkic uh, commander um, and tribal chieftain, regained and even expanded the territories lost by the Safavids and had himself proclaimed Shah in 1736. One of his signature policies was to attempt at a rapprochement with the Ottomans and the Sunni world at large by entering into negotiations with the Ottomans about the acceptance of Twelver Shism as the fifth uh, Sunni legal school. While the negotiations fell through, it is possible that the text was produced against the background of contemporary debates in Iran about the religious identity of the realm. Reducing such a Turkic translations as uh, Reza, Reza's, some, uh, someone, uh, some one and a half centuries after the previous known Turkic translations of the Rosa, uh, which had become a key part of Shia ritual sponsored by the Safavid elite, and which was also greatly espoused and identified uh, identified with by Iranian society at large is most certainly significant. There aren't uh, many sources about this rather turbulent period. One is an otherwise obscure poet uh, from the vicinity of uh, Tabriz by the name of Rahima, who flourished in the 1730s. Remarkably, Rahima, who is almost fanatically anti Ottoman, produces an anthology in which virtually all the stories, reports, are related to the Prophet and none to the 12 Imams. In addition, Rahima describes both the Sunni and the 12 Shiite modes of the ritual prayer without indicating any preference. Although Rahima enumerates and praises the 12, uh, 12 Imams several times, he never mentions in concrete terms whom they fought against, only mentioning that they were in conflict with the devil or evil. Moreover, he praises Abu Hanifa, the eponymous founder of the Hanafi legal school, adding the following, what's a Shiite? What's a Sunni? They're all Muslims. Brethren in religion, they are people of, of the right faith. At the same time in other poems, Rahima imitates heavily antinomian messianic specimens written by none other but Shah Ismail. It seems that at least some strand of the religio-political culture of the early Safavids might have been alive at the time, and it was this that Nader's policies of rapprochement between Shiism and Sunnism tapped into. It would seem that Reza's, uh, might have in, <coughs> Reza might have intended his work to resonate with such an audience, hoping perhaps to bring them back uh, to the Twelve Shiite fold. So in conclusion, uh, questions remain. 
requiring further research, partly deriving from the understudied state of the field. What's the relationship between Turkic martyrologies like the Jenan with other collections of such narratives produced by an increasingly institutionalized schism, such as Majlis's aforesaid anthology or martyrology? How are they related to the anti uh, how, and how are they related to the Anatolian poetic variants of these narratives or to the Abu Muslim cycle? In such martyrdom narratives as the Jinan, the community can experience and re-experience its own piety and religious identity. Reza created a paraphrase of Kashifi's work that presented communal mourning for the tragedy of Karbala in its full eschatological dimensions and as the key to salvation on the Day of Judgment. He took its homiletic function to the next level with its repetitive, highly transparent structure and simple style, addressing it to a Turkophone audience, though the composition of this audience awaits further inquiries. I have also argued that we can see such martyrologies as part of efforts on the part of court-related circles to appeal to the sensitivities and tastes of Turkophone literati and the Kuzilbash, uh, Turkophone literati and the Kuzilbash aristocracy, and also introduce them to a cutting edge court culture and further Shia piety. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ferenc, um, for, for your talk today. Um, I uh, invite um, our discussant, Professor Babayan, um, and you to um, have a conversation um, before we open the floor to our audience members. Um, if you have a question uh, in the audience, you um, can type your question in the Q&A box and we will um, address them afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra, for uh, inviting me and allowing me this opportunity to enter into a conversation with Ferenc's new work. I really appreciate the fact that you're continuing really this important work on the politics um, of Turkic from the language to the literature to these literary practices from the medieval now adding today for us a new um, episode, a new um, series of sources, but one in particular, Khoksari's uh, Jinan, um, to take us to the late um, 17th, early 18th century. Um, and it's a, you know, a long durée. There's a lot to, I think, um, difficulties and challenges, right, to try to fill out this narrative. Um, but your frame itself has been one of thinking about these processes of vernacularization, right? And I particularly appreciate your emphasis on trying to figure out what the social and cultural conditions for literalization um, are. So let me begin by asking you um, a question that hopefully will ground us a little bit more in um, these cultural and social frames to think about a period, uh, at least in the end of the um, Safavi period, in the end of the 17th century, a period of multilingualism really, where Arabic, um, Persian, and Turkish really rather than being in contest with one another, which you kind of use this paradigm of a struggle between Persian and Arabic, um, which has nationalistic overtones in and of itself, I would see it more as a period really where um, each of these languages are present um, in writing too. So some of my is have Persian, Arabic and Turkish together, each playing, each language in a way, playing its particular role, not in competi competition necessarily with one another, but very much, I think, um, uh, comfortable or resigned also to the particular linguistic role that each of these languages are taking, whether it has to do with, you know, literature or philosophy in Arabic, let's say literature in Persian, I don't want to divide it up even necessarily so much through these disciplinary lines. But I think that there is, and I'll send you some examples because I think looking at these majmuas uh, with these three languages uh, aside one another might really help you also think more about, you know, Turkish and uh, Turkic and ver vernacularization. And I'm wondering, how are you using the term? Are you using Pollock's uh, understanding that vernacular 
um, is a language of space uh, versus cosmopolitan, which is a more mobile language. And in that case, then neither Persian Arabic or Turkish really works because all three are in this period mobile languages, right? With Turkish, you mentioned Chagatai, Turkmen and Ottoman. I mean, the example of Piri Reis going all the way to India and using Chagatai himself to communicate with um, uh, the principalities, individuals at court there, you know, um, render actually the, the use of vernacular unlike how you used it for the medieval period, um, but in this early modern period, a little bit more problematic. So I wanted to um, ask you to share with us and probe you a little bit on this usage. Um, yeah, there are several things uh, to, to say, and thanks for the, this uh, question. Indeed, uh, I've been thinking about this uh, for a long time. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, I understand vernacular as a kind of a relative phenomenon, so con basically contextual, contextual, con contextulated uh, term. So, in certain case, in certain cases, Turkish can act as a as a cosmopolitan language, uh, whereas uh, in other contexts, for example, in a let's say within a local Iranian context, it can act as a uh, vernacular uh so the vernacular uh, context so it's kind of a it's a relation it's a relational uh term right on the other hand um yes we you can speak about the the persianate world and how uh, uh persianate uh literary practices uh, were sort of formed a network uh, a, a cosmopolitan network uh over a grand uh, geography, um, including Central Asia, uh, Iran, the Ottoman space, etc. Um, but we can also see a degree of uh, sort of connected courts, court cultures connected through uh, uh, Turkic as well, right? Um, so, and 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 the question there is. To what extent? Uh, to what extent was was this significant? What what was the quantity uh, of of this uh, literary production? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things to, to to consider here is is to consider um, these uh, practices and the, these works in 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 a networked fashion, mm -hmm. right? So what what you what you want to to look at is how uh, these various um, spaces and nodes are, are 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 connected what how courts or not just courts but let's let's call them dargah rather so both palace and and sufi uh, um, um, host, um hostel uh, connected uh, through networks and, and literary practices and perhaps that that's a more fruitful way uh, to look at these instead of uh, sort of a modern perspective, which would have you institute an institutionalized uh, institutions uh, maintaining uh, such uh, literary languages and literary idioms. Great. So that takes me um, nicely into um, my second uh, question, which is something that you um, yourself articulated in the paper and in your previous work on how confessionalism really generates vernacularization, right? Um, and the relationship between the two. And I'm uh, wondering really about uh, Khoshkhari's choice of Turkmen to write the Jinanul uh, Momenin. Um, at a moment, could we think of it in terms, again, rather than competition and trying to win over um, a population that maybe has moved to the other side, but to really think about a diversification of languages of worship um, and uh, to think about Turkish. And that's where I see actually these Majmuez, just like you're seeing Persian, simple Persian being actually used as a language of um, conversion or familiarizing um, Esfahanis uh, with uh, the tenets of Twelver Shiism, that, that this also could be Turkish, Turkmen, could be um, 
also used as a form, a vehicle of teaching, as you're saying, also a vehicle of performing. Um, and then, you know, in addition to the agency of Khoksari, I wonder about the agency of the scribes and the copyists. You mentioned, you know, a Molo Mirza Muhammad uh, uh, or Molo Muhammad Ghazvini um, in 1739, a Muhammad Momene Tabrizi in 1740. And then you showed us another manuscript, which I was fascinating, uh, this torn up Tehran University manuscript. Yeah. What can we say about then also, you know, the, these two scribes and whoever the Tehran University manuscript scribe are within a period of one year, 1739 and 1740, right, are copying um, this manuscript. There's a Ghazvini and a Tabrizi, and from their name, it's hard to say, you know, they, were they also multilingual? Do you see in their transcription or tra uh, copying of uh, Khoksari some shifts that go on as far as linguistic registers are, are concerned, which can give you, again, a sense about of, you know, how well they knew Turkish or, or, or not, right? Were they, you know, bilingual um, or not? And then to think also, so this moment of circulation, and then it stops, right? And to bring also that into your understanding of, of what Khoksari is actually um, doing. So how well they knew to... Um, okay, so we do have a lot of sources, Western travelers using Turkish, uh, Turkic wherever they went, basically. Um, obviously, we should take some of this information carefully. Um, but for example, it's very interesting that there is a there is a, a dictionary um, uh, which has recently been uh, published by uh, uh, Willem Flor and Hassan Javadi. Um, um, it, it, this does it doesn't have a title. I can't remember now. Anyway, so it was produced by three uh, um, three generations of of um, of Tajik, that is Persian uh, mm -hmm. bureaucrats, right? It's a it's a dictionary for, for actually not only for Chagatai Turkic but also from uh, uh, Kalmuk uh, and Ottoman Turkish as well. So. Um, I do think that that you do see, particularly. I mean, this would wouldn't go against logic to to think that uh, people, uh, bureaucrats affiliated with the court, uh, would definitely have the opportunity to uh, to get training or learn uh, Turkey to the extent that they can even uh, produce uh, literary works. So, uh, I have no uh, no doubt about that. Um, um, it's very interesting, the agency of, of scribes, um, you know, this leads me to think that, you know, so what, you know, what makes us think uh, as of, of this literary language that, that they are producing in uh, sort of uh, separate literary language? Well, one is that, you uh, well, one is obviously politics, as someone used to say. Uh, uh, a language is a dialect with a government, an, a, a, an army, and a navy, right? Um, <laughs> that is, uh, language is a dialect a dialect that has institutions, that has politics behind it, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you also see that uh, the uh, some of the uh, orthography is pretty much crystallized, so it's mm. pretty uh, it's pretty easy to differentiate from at, at, at a certain point it's pretty mm -hmm. easy to differ differentiate uh, these manuscripts manuscripts from the otherwise linguistically related mm -hmm. um, uh, Ottoman Turkish or Anatolian uh, mm -hmm. uh, manuscript material mm -hmm. so, so uh, the same thing I mean you know I, I see a lot of manuscripts being translate uh, transcribed or copied and it's clear that the, the scribe doesn't know Arabic um, and there and there are mistakes there and so that those are one ways in which you can actually see the linguistic registers as they're entering in but if if you're saying that the scribe would know um, I mean so that's but I would think it would be maybe for the future as you're developing your chapter to really think 
about these different renditions and 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 copying and seeing what mm. each of the version and even the materiality of that Tehran University one it's so worn out it's so used right so you can uh, think about your what your assumption is that this is a perform it, it is like a script for a performance uh. actually that really is a great backing for um you know your speculation there so i'll just ask one question and then we should open up to the audience one last question and that is more about you know the meaning of this work uh, of the genon itself right and how he what his intention is as he says who will benefit from the genon kind of very openly um turks who uh have a lack of discernment um rendering and writing the affairs of martyrs, um, moving between and Shaw and singing. I wonder if from his own words of, uh, you know, who is the audience and benefited. And I also think that uh, that he uses uh, Majlisi's um, Jalol Uyun is very important because that's a work that Majlisi also uses in simple Persian, but is legitimizing the first chapter, crime. That cathartic experience of Karbala. Um, so it's Ashlichtan, which he's, you know, in his first chapter of the, the work, he says the Zahir and Botan become actually one through the experience of crying. And then you add on this visualizing of paradise, right? That you see um, in, um, uh, the work of Khoksori, right? And paradise is there, you say, in the battlefield itself. So maybe that will tell us also something, tell you something that you can tease out about the religiosity really of those who are not only receiving, but maybe are, are being shaped by and uh, dialogically the Jinan itself. Um, sorry, just, uh, can, you, can you rephrase the question? So... No, the, you... I'm, I'm just wondering if you listen to what Khoksari is saying himself in, I guess, the debauche about what he's trying to do. Who will benefit from the Jinan itself? Why do Turks have a lack of sense of discernment? Uh, why does he bring Encha together with song? And also, the, you know, his drawing from Majlisi uh, Jr. Uh, from his Uyun, it is also a very performative embodied experience that Majlisi is emphasizing around crime because there was such a debate amongst the ulama, whether you could cry, whether men could cry. Yeah. Um, and, and so that there too, it gives you a, a sense about, you know, the kind of religious um, body of individuals who are um, ready to read and hear um, in uh, Torkman um, about these, they're experiencing Karbala itself. Hmm. No, I mean, I think um, in a sense, um, you know, such texts as related to practice uh, are also creators of community, right? So I think uh, basically what's happening here is, is that there is a you know, a new, new. It's not as not necessarily a central. You know, uh, governed by a central command, mm -hmm. but sim simply uh, there is a new sense of of what, how religion should work. Uh, there is a new economic and institutional uh, framework around it, and the point is to include uh, these uh, Turkmen's uh, in in it. Uh, now, you know. Obviously, some some of the audience were illiterate; others were more literate uh, than the than the others. Uh, obviously, the the assumption is that they don't have um, the literate, the literary, uh, you know, kind of chancery training uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that you know would help you understand a more a more complex uh, uh, sort of uh, theological. Or even literary uh, uh, text. So I think that that's the uh, assumption uh, behind behind the. So that's the intended audience. Uh, 
uh, mm. for this text. Uh, and just one more thing to, to add to your previous question, to, to previous question, I mean, who, who were these, who, who uh, you know, who, uh, what kind of scribes there might have been, etc. You also see, um, I mean, my favorite example is Sadiqi Beg, the famous painter, who was a Kuzilbash Turkman, right? But you also see in the Taskera uh, material, that is the biographical material, uh, you know, a level of integration of the Kuzilbash, you know, totally. uh, tribal elite, uh, also also into into sort of Persian uh, Persian Absolutely. urban uh, networks. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying that we have to maybe think about it in terms of multilingualism as well, right? So yes. rather than sort of, you know, uh, monolingualism uh, in that sense, right? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much um, to both of you for um, your discussion. Um, just a note again to the audience that um, if you do have a question, please um, write it out into Q and A box, and and uh, I will be able to bring that up um, to uh, the speaker. Um, we have one question um, from Ali Reza Karimi, um, who's saying, um, currently many people in the villages and even the cities of Azerbaijan do not know Farsi. And in fact, don't you think that the translation of Rosat Shahada into Turkish was for the purpose of conveying the political and religious concepts and intentions of the government to a larger number of Iranian people. Thank you very much. Um, sure. Uh, I mean, the short answer is 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 yes, uh, but sort of a qualified yes. So we don't exactly know the circulation of such works, and and the problem the problem always is that we just have so many uh, copies. Uh, at hand. So we can't say that, oh, I mean, uh, for example, unlike Fuzuli's work, which had hundreds, basically probably hundreds of, of manuscripts, right? Uh, this uh, particular work doesn't have uh, that many. And actually, uh, the Turkic the Turkic material, the manuscript material uh, that we have is, you know, is much, 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 much more minuscule compared to the deluge of uh, Persian uh, literary production, so it's 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 difficult to to uh, 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 so it's difficult to 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 sort of give a straight answer to this. Okay, who was it exactly uh, uh, intended for? But definitely, you are you are absolutely right that uh, so sort of this was part of a kind of quote unquote uh, re political religious uh, propaganda. Great, thank you very much, Ferenc. Um, I, I have a question uh, for you myself, um, and uh, this goes back to um, uh, what I'm interested in uh, uh, in my research on, on the Ali Nome. I'm not sure you're, you're familiar with uh, with it. It's um it's an early religious uh, Shi'i religious epic um, from the 11th century, um, and it is. Um, in the, in the context of maybe Manak Beb Khan, um, it recounts the battle of the camel and, uh, and Sifin um, in uh, Motakareb. So it, it is harking back to uh, Ferdowsi's Shahnameh. Um, I think it is kind of a first attempt at um, casting um, valid history into a Persian epic form. Um, However, it features a very strong opposition to um, the Shahnameh and uh, kind of, um, its legends as duruq or, or falsehood, um, as opposed to you know, the true um, early Islamic history as it is presented there. And as I understand, and you go back to Kashifi first, um, Kashifi's Rosat Ashuhada um, is also heavily infused with the Shahnameh, um, and I'm. I'm wondering whether you've seen any uh, sort of opposition to um, kind of the the, the Persian material um, of the Shahnameh um, as being false, as being the ruh, um, or whether um, there is not that anxiety anymore in you know this uh, and this genre of having to discard kind of the the Persian heritage that way. Um, 
And what about the Jinan and Mimin? Like what, what do we see in terms of uh, kind of involvement of um, the Persian and literary tradition in there? Right, I mean, <clears throat> it's a good question. Um, but Majlisi's uh, collection, I mean, Majlisi's uh, Jelaul Uyun is a very good example. It doesn't have the kind of uh, sort of uh, Persian, let's call let's call it the, the literature of kingship. Uh, it, it doesn't have this kind of uh, uh, Shahnameh uh, related um, you know, motives, uh, and neither does uh, Rezaz. So I think I think this is uh, this is a kind of a new type of, in this sense, a new type of of uh, martyrology. Uh, which uh, you know emphasizes uh, the twelve Shiite Sharia-oriented um, sort of uh, Sharia-oriented piety. Okay, thank you. Um, we have um, two more questions from the audience that I'd also like to bring up. Um, first question: uh, Kimya Shukuhi asking, "What revelation about martyrologies did you uncover?" between the languages in your research? Um, I'm not sure I entire, entirely understand uh, the question. Can you can you rephrase it, please? <laughs> Is it perhaps about differences between martyrologies um, according to what language um, it is written in? Huh. Well, if it's that, if that is the question, um, so I don't think it's it's language. This is language based as much as audience based, right? So uh, the difference is, uh, um, um, you know, audience based, and and it's uh, yeah. So uh, you know, between uh, Karba, uh, between uh, Karshefi and Fozuli, um, in the sense of uh, attitude to the, pol uh, the the poetic language, the literary heritage um, uh, structure, um, I don't so I don't see kind of a paradigmatic uh, difference other than the one being written Turkish and the other one written in in Persian. Uh, whereas I do see a paradigmatic difference between Khaksari, Reza Khaksari, or, or Majlisis and 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 Koshibi's works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she specified um, within the cultural context of Persian versus Arab influences. Um, the culture of Persian versus Arab Arabic influences. Um, <clears throat> um, I think at, at this point, um, um, sort of there is a, a there is a literary tradition. You can call it the Chancery. Uh, Chancery prose, which is heavily uh, Persian, the heavily Arabized uh, Persian. Um, you know, you do have uh, certain sections of this kind of uh, highly hyper literate uh, language in uh, Fuzuli uh, and also in in Karshafi, particularly in the in the uh, introductory uh, uh, parts. Um, but most of most of the narrative parts in 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 these works are mostly uh, written in in simpler language. The simplest of them being uh, Reza Yaqob. Sorry. Okay, thank you. We have one last question, perhaps for today, which is um, that you mentioned Fotovat. Um, uh, in a part of your uh, presentation. And the question is, is it related to the general photovat as a way of life and behavior or specific uh, book or piece of literature? Um, basically, photovat was a kind of a code of ethics, um, sort of uh, um, uh, espoused by um, you know, Sufi communities and, and, and guilds, and that's how I uh, understood it. So initially, these sort of uh, processions were just done by the local, you know, the local guys, as it were, the the local, uh, the local guild, some kind of uh, you know head of a, a certain quarter of of the town, and uh, and 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 
from the 17th century, mid 17th century on, it seems that the government, uh, as as well as its governors, also took a heavy uh, role in organizing and also con therefore controlling uh, these uh, practices. Right, so that's what I meant. Great. Um, thank you so much, um, Berens, for for your talk today. Um, and thank you so much, um, Catherine Babayan, um, for your remarks and the uh, animated discussion between the two of you. Um, I invite uh, Mustafa to um, to end um, our session today with a couple of words. Um, but um, thank you again uh, to all of you uh, for being here. Thank you, Alexandra. Yeah, I don't have much to I don't have much to say. I just wanted also to thank everyone. Uh, from the audience for your presence, patience, and also the thoughtful and insightful questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Chirkish and Professor Babayan, and yourself, Alexandra, for uh, putting together this amazing event. And also, of course, our team, Tiffany, Gianna, Lisa, and Razman. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, the audience to kindly, if you have time, take just a few minutes. Uh, it would be very helpful for us if you could if you could hear from you, um, your views on um, how things went, how we can improve things. Um, there is, uh, I think, yes, the, um, there's a link for the survey, actually. We'd be grateful if you could take that. And this will be um, the penultimate, yes, <laughs> event for this year. We have one more event on April 5th. Um, Alexander, is it going to be hybrid? Because I don't want to misinform our audience. Because we know that it is in person, at least. Uh, it's going to be in Vancouver. So if you happen to be in Vancouver or if you are in Vancouver, please, we would love to see you. Uh, it's going to be by Dr. Uh, Domenico Ingenito, and it's going to be about Furugo Farrokhzad. So uh, supplementary information will be posted on the um, lecture series uh, webpage. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's all. And. Uh, if there are any other final remarks by the guests, please go ahead. And if not, of course, um, have a wonderful rest of your day or night, wherever you're located. Dr. Babayan and Dr. Turkish, if you don't mind, we would love you to stay just for a few minutes for like debriefing if you have time. And if not, sure. we will catch up through email. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks to the audience. Thank you.